But if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We will be looking together this morning at chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Let us hear the word of the Lord together this morning. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to His throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. May God bless the reading and hearing of His Word. Well, for those of you who may not be aware, on Sunday mornings here at First Baptist Church, over the last several months, we have been working through the book of Revelation. Now, of course, with all that's been going on in our world, we decided to take a break from that series over the last two Sundays. And so we looked at Psalm 121 and Lamentations 3, two texts that remind us of the help and reassure us of the hope we have in Christ during these times of uncertainty. But this morning, I want us to pick back up where we left off a few weeks ago here in the book of Revelation. And as some of you will remember, we left off at the end of chapter 11 with that beautiful description of the coming kingdom of Christ, which means this morning we come to Revelation chapter 12. Now, ideally, we would look at this entire chapter all together in one sermon because all that we find in chapter 12 all goes together. But of course, I realize that these aren't ideal circumstances, so uh, I'm not going to try your patience by preaching through this whole chapter this morning. You can thank me later. Instead, what I want us to do is I want us to look just at verses 1 through 6. And as we look at these verses, I want to try to answer three questions for you. Who? what, and so what. Who, what, and so what. Who are these verses talking about? Who are the characters that are being described? And what is actually happening here? What what are we meant to see and understand is taking place? And then, so what? What is the significance of for us? What are the takeaways, the lessons for us from a passage like this? So that's the way I want us to work through these verses this morning, answering those three questions. Who, what, and so what? Let's start with the who question. Who are the main characters in these verses, and who are they referring to? Well, Three main characters that were given here in these verses. The woman, the child, and the dragon. The woman, the child, and the dragon. 
First, let's consider the woman. Look again at verses 1 and 2. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, we know both from the nature of the book of Revelation, it's an apocalyptic book, so it is frequently using symbolism, and we know from the language that's used here, a great sign or symbol appeared in heaven that we are meant to see this woman symbolically, not literally. So while it may be tempting for us to see this woman as Mary, the mother of our Lord, the context would suggest that it's not Mary specifically who is being symbolized here, but rather the people of God in general. So when chapter 12 talks about the woman, it's talking about the people of God, the covenant community of God's faithful people. So Israel in the Old Covenant and the church in the New Covenant. So the woman here in Revelation chapter 12 refers to the people of God, both Israel and the church. Now here in our passage, it's mainly Israel that's in view, though the church would certainly be included in verse 6. And then as we'll see in the rest of the chapter, it is mainly the church that is in view. So the woman is a reference to the people of God. Israel under the old covenant and the church under the new covenant. Now look again at how this woman is described, how the people of God are pictured here. In verse 1, she's clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet, and on her head she is wearing a crown of twelve stars. Now what we're meant to see here is a picture of this woman in beauty and splendor and exalted. This is a picture of royalty. She is seen as reigning, exercising her rule and dominion and influence in the world. And remember, this is part of the promise God gave to His people, that they would be a kingdom. Even Abraham is promised that kings will come from you. So there's this picture, this hint of the royalty of God's people. And specifically, this is a reference to Genesis chapter 37, where Joseph has this memorable dream. And, and if you are familiar with that passage, you may remember even the imagery from Joseph's dream. You remember that in his dream where his brothers bow down to him, his father Jacob is the sun, his mother Rachel is the moon, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of, that make up the 12 tribes of Israel, they are seen as 12 stars. And so here, the people of God are described in terms of splendor and royalty, exalted in heaven, clothed with the glory of the sun, exercising dominion with the moon under her feet, and wearing a crown, a crown of 12 stars, reminding us, of course, of the 12 tribes of Israel, and one from Israel. The tribe of Judah is promised that he will be king, that the scepter will not depart from him. And that's why this woman is pictured here as being pregnant, because she will give birth to a royal son, one who will exercise dominion and rule over all the nations. And as I mentioned, that's why in verse 2, this woman is described as being pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. 
It's interesting that both the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Micah describe Israel in this way. They describe Israel as a woman who is pregnant and in labor pains who will bring forth the Messiah into the world. So in some sense, this verse, Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, summarizes something of the whole history of Israel with all her struggles, all her difficulties, all her labor pains until finally she brings the Messiah, that son of David, the one from the line of Judah into the world. That's why Douglas Kelly and His commentary on the book of Revelation can write a statement like this. Old Testament Israel was in a sense pregnant with Christ for thousands of years. Israel was being used as a womb from which the Messiah would be born. Israel was being used as a womb from which the Messiah would be born. And that's really what we are meant to see being pictured and symbolized here. So that's the woman. Second, the child. Who is this child that this woman is pregnant with? Well, as we've already alluded to, the child is the Messiah, the royal son who will rule over all the nations. This is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Look at verse 5. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to His throne. Now this reference here in verse 5 to ruling all the nations with a rod of iron is an allusion back to Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm which points to the coming son of David, the coming king, the coming Messiah who will rule over all the nations, over every king and ruler. And so the male child that is born here in verse 5 is that promised son of David, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And as we'll discuss in a moment, he is caught up to God and to his throne where he now rules and reigns as king over all. So we have the woman, we have the child, and finally, the dragon. The dragon. Look at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. Now, there's no question who this dragon is. He is Satan, the devil. In fact, look at verse 9. John makes this very plain to us. Verse 9, we read, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Now, dragons were often used in the ancient world as symbols for evil and chaos. And this dragon is symbolic of the supreme evil in our world. The evil one himself, Satan. He's described in verse 3 as a great red dragon. Great in the sense of powerful and large, not to be taken lightly as we sing. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. And he is red because of the violence and bloodshed and murder that he inflicts on the world. And he is terrifying in appearance. He is just 
beastly looking and he's meant to be terrifying to us. He has seven heads, we're told, and ten horns on those seven heads. And on those heads, he is wearing seven diadems. Now, the seven heads remind us that this dragon seems almost impossible to defeat because he can strike us from all sides. As soon as you cut off one head, he attacks you from another. And then on these seven heads are ten horns, symbolizing strength and power. These ten horns are themselves an allusion back to the fourth and most terrifying of the four beasts that Daniel has a vision of there in Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, the ten horns of that fourth beast are associated with ten kings, ten human rulers. That's why here they are said, these ten horns are said to be wearing seven diadems, pointing to their authority. So we're reminded here that this dragon often exercises his power, his influence, his craft and cunning through human rulers through human authorities, through human kingdoms. Which means that his power, his rule, isn't limited to just one kingdom or just one period of time. No, he continues to exert his evil influence and his evil schemes all throughout human history, through different kingdoms, through different empires, through different rulers. So that's the who of this passage. The woman, referring to the people of God, both Israel and the church. The child, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the dragon, referring to Satan. Now, let's consider the second question. The what question. What exactly is happening here with this woman, this child, and this dragon? Well, there's tension between them. There's conflict because the dragon wants to kill the child. He he waits in anticipation for his birth so that he might devour him. Look at verse 4. His tail, that is the tail of the dragon, swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. Why? So that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now let me speak for just a minute to the first part of verse 4 before we get to the end of the verse. Have you ever heard someone say that when Satan rebelled against God, he enticed or influenced or carried with him a third of the angels from heaven to follow him in his rebellion? If you've ever heard that, if you've ever wondered, where do they get that number from? Where do they get that idea that a third of the angels in heaven followed him? Well, they get that idea, at least most of them take that idea from this verse, from the first part of Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. However, I don't think that that is what this verse is referring to. This doesn't seem to be a reference to Satan's original rebellion against God and the number of angels who followed him in that rebellion. That's not what seems to be in view here. Instead, what seems to be in view, and what I think is the best way to interpret this verse, is to see it as another allusion back to the book of Daniel. This time, an allusion back to Daniel chapter 8, where in Daniel 8, you have an evil ruler who is said to throw down some of the stars and trample on them. And there in Daniel chapter 8, the stars that are thrown down are the people of Israel. They're the people of God. And they're being thrown down and trampled on is a reference to this evil ruler, 
persecuting the people of God. So here in Revelation 12, you have Satan seen as a large and powerful and terrifying dragon who with the flick of his tail sweeps down a third of the stars of heaven and casts them to the earth. And I think we're meant to see a connection between what was alluded to back in Daniel 8 and what is happening here. In other words, in his persecution against the people of God, Satan is flexing his muscles, if it were. He's showing off his power. And just as he persecuted the people of God then, so now he is ready to pounce on the very Messiah of God. He is ready to attack this child about to be born. That's why this dragon there at the end of verse 4 is said to be positioned right there in the labor and delivery room. Just waiting on this child to be born. Not to welcome him into the world, but waiting to take him out of the world waiting to destroy him, to devour him. Now, why this particular imagery? It is vivid to be sure, but but why this imagery of a woman giving birth to a male child? Why is the conflict centered here in, in this moment at his birth? Well, because this is meant to point us to the cosmic conflict that has been going on in the world ever since the Garden of Eden back in Genesis chapter 3. There, the ancient serpent, the dragon, Satan, the the devil came and tempted Eve to rebel against God and His rule. And as a result of that encounter, as a result of sin coming into the world, God announces judgment on the serpent. And God promises there that there would be ongoing conflict between the serpent and and the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3.15, we have what is often referred to as the first gospel, the first good news given to us in a fallen world. Because there in Genesis 3.15, God promises that the woman will give birth to a son who will crush the head of the serpent. She will bear a son who will spell the demise and defeat of the dragon, of the serpent, of Satan. And so ever since then, we have seen this conflict ensue between the seed of the woman and the serpent. He has been feverishly, furiously trying to put an end to this promised line so that the son who will crush his head could never be born. And in some sense, that's really the story of the whole Old Testament. That's why you see the conflict between Cain and Abel, between Ishmael and Isaac, between Jacob and Esau, between Joseph and his brothers. That's why you see barrenness in the patriarch or excuse me in the matriarchs of Israel being so problematic. That's why you see Pharaoh trying to put an end to all the male infants who were Hebrews born in Egypt at the time of Moses. That's why you see Saul hatching murderous plots against David. That's That's why in the time of Esther, you see Haman conspire to wipe out all the Jews. And this is why when the Magi come to Herod to inquire about the birth of the Christ child, he has all the infants in Bethlehem put to death. Behind all of that, behind all of those actions, is Satan trying to devour this promised child before this promised child can be born and defeat him. That's why you have this particular imagery used here. And so when Satan is unsuccessful at killing Jesus at his birth, what do we see happening throughout Jesus' ministry? We see Satan continuing to try to devour him. 
It's why Satan shows up when Jesus is fasting in the wilderness and he comes to tempt Jesus. That's why when Peter tries to get Jesus to abandon the cross, what does Jesus say to him? What does Jesus recognize? Who does Jesus recognize is behind such a suggestion when he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And when our Lord is betrayed and handed over to the authorities by Judas, what do we read happening before that? Then Satan entered into Judas. Satan is the one behind all of it. So this conflict plays out all throughout the pages of the Old Testament and all throughout the pages of the Gospels. But the height of that conflict, the the climax of the conflict, is collapsed into just one brief description at the end of verse 5. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to His throne. Here you have Jesus' birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension all in view. All of that is included here. And we're told that Satan's attempts are thwarted. Now, it looks to us in verse 4, in the beginning of verse 5, as if there will be certain death for this child when he is born. But we are told that he is caught up to God and to his throne. He is snatched from the jaws of this dragon, turning the tables on him. Now, yes, the devil finally succeeds in putting Jesus to death at the cross But the story doesn't end the way that Satan thinks it will. Because three days later, Jesus will rise again from the dead in victory, scoring the decisive blow, crushing the head of the serpent. And Jesus now reigns, seated at the right hand of Him who sits on the throne. And Satan has been decisively defeated. And because He has been defeated in his fury, in his anger at losing this battle. He begins to pursue the woman. He pursues the people of the Messiah, the church. And that's why we read what we read in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So the woman flees into the wilderness where God protects her and nourishes her for 1,260 days. Now, that amount of time ought to sound familiar to you because it's the same amount of time we saw back in chapter 11. It's the same amount of time as the 42 months, or the three and a half years, or here, 1,260 days. This is the amount of time that symbolizes the period between the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ back to heaven and His return to earth. This is the period that is symbolic of the church age, this age in which we now live, this age in which we can expect to face persecution from the world and in which we are promised protection from God. That's what's pictured happening here in verse 6. And we'll see more of this pictured for us in the rest of chapter 12. So that's the what of these verses. The woman gives birth 
to the male child, and the dragon attempts to devour the child. The promised Messiah, the long-awaited Christ, is born, and Satan seeks to devour him. And while he is eventually successful in killing him, Jesus Christ rises from the dead in victory and is caught up to God and God's throne where he now reigns over all, having defeated Satan and all his evil schemes. But still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. And so now he turns his attention on us, the people who follow Christ. And so we are pictured here as having fled into the wilderness where we too will be tempted and tried and persecuted, but God will be with us to protect us and nourish us until the day Christ comes again. So that's the who and that's the what. Finally, let's consider the so what. The so what? What's the significance of all of this for us? Why does a passage like this matter to us? Well, for two reasons at least. Number one, it reminds us of the context of the Christian life. It reminds us of something about the context of the Christian life. It reminds us of what we can expect to experience in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And in particular, it reminds us of two aspects about the context of the Christian life. Wilderness and warfare. Wilderness and warfare. Brothers and sisters, remember that the Christian life is lived in the wilderness. It is lived in the context of the wilderness. Look again at the beginning of verse 6. And the woman, now this is the church, the people of God, fled into the wilderness. So after Christ's ascension back to heaven, now we, the people of God, are seen as fleeing into the wilderness, reminding us that we haven't reached the promised land yet. We haven't reached the, the place of rest yet. We're still in the wilderness with all its tests, with all its trials, with all its temptations. Yes, we have been redeemed. Yes, the greater exodus of Jesus' death and resurrection has occurred. Yes, we've been rescued from our slavery and bondage to sin. But just like Israel of old, we now have to endure the wilderness before we cross the Jordan and enter into that promised land. But here's the good news. Just like Israel, we will be protected and provided for in the wilderness. That's why verse 6 says we have a place prepared by God and we will be nourished by Him. Just like God provided manna in the wilderness for Israel to nourish them and just as He protected them along the way and brought them into the land of promise, so God feeds us. He nourishes us on the manna of His Word and He promises to keep us, to preserve us, to protect us. Even though we may be persecuted along the way, He will ensure that we make it to the promised land where we will enjoy rest in His presence forever. So we are reminded of the wilderness context of the Christian life. So brothers and sisters, don't be disillusioned and don't be discouraged when you face suffering or hardship. Don't somehow think that this ought to be strange or out of character. This is part of the experience of living in the wilderness during this time. But trust that even in the wilderness, God will be gracious to provide for us and nourish us and protect us and keep us and see us all the way home. And we're also reminded of the warfare context of the Christian life. Because the reason that the woman has to flee into the wilderness 
is because the dragon is now pursuing her. The dragon has turned his attention on her, on us. Now he is seeking to devour us. Now he turns his, all his terror, all his power, he, he turns the war on us. I mean, this is what we'll come to see in the rest of the chapter. In fact, look at verses 13 and 14. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Again, the, that three and a half year period, 42 months, 1,260 days. But we see here that we are pursued into the wilderness because the dragon has now turned his fury and anger and attention on us. He's been beaten. He's been defeated by Jesus. And so in anger, he now turns on the people of Jesus. He tries to devour us. That's why we read earlier from 1 Peter chapter 5, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He seeks to devour us now. So be on your guard. Be watchful. You have an enemy who is at war with you, who seeks to bring you down. He hates you because he hates Jesus whom you love. And listen, this is the ultimate cause behind the persecution of Christians in the world. You want to know why Christians are persecuted all around the globe? This is the real reason why. It's not just because there are authoritarian regimes or terrorist groups who find a threat against or find a threat in Christianity. It is because behind every one of those authoritarian regimes and behind every one of those terrorist groups is a great red dragon, a terrifying monster, the devil himself who is intent on bringing the church down because he could not bring down her Lord. And therefore, we are reminded here that the context of the Christian life is one of warfare in the wilderness. So that's the first answer to the so what question. The first reason why this passage matters to us. It reminds us of the context of the Christian life. Number two, it reminds us of the comfort of the Christian life. It reminds us of something about the comfort that we have as Christians. And that comfort is found in the fact that the dragon, the devil, the enemy who seeks to devour us, who seeks to destroy the church, he is a defeated enemy. The child, verse 5 says, was called up to God and to His throne where He now reigns in victory. Which means the dragon can never win. He could not defeat Jesus and He cannot defeat us. Oh sure, He may kill us, but even then we win and He loses because to live is Christ and to die is gain for us. So the devil is fighting a losing campaign because the decisive battle has already been won when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven in victory. Sure, the war still rages on, but the outcome has already been decided. To use the terminology of chess, the devil has been put in check. He can't win. He, he can still make moves on the board, but he, he can't win. And one day, God will announce checkmate and the game will be over. And no matter how hard the devil tries and no matter how much he may cheat, he can't win. His attempts to thwart God's plans will not work. They never have and they never will. So brothers and sisters, take comfort. Because if you are in Christ, you are on the winning side. 
no matter how intense the battle, no matter how great the persecution, no matter how weary we may grow in this wilderness, no matter how much it may seem like we are losing, we can endure and we can persevere with the hope and the comfort that ours is never a losing battle. Listen to Jim Hamilton as he makes this point from this passage. Hamilton says, Satan, here in chapter 12, looks like he has all the advantages. He's a dragon with seven heads and ten horns against a pregnant woman. Who would you bet on in that conflict? Does it sometimes seem to you that Satan has the upper hand in the struggle of the ages? Does it look like he is the one who knows how to fight to win and God always seems to pick the losing strategy? Turn the other cheek. Bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Choose the weak things of the world. It's almost as though God shows up on the playground to pick his team, and instead of picking the guys who look like they can play, he picks the obviously inferior team. And how does it always turn out? God triumphs every time. So, when everything in your life looks unimpressive, sure to lose, insignificant, trust Christ and watch for the glory of God to be demonstrated. Brothers and sisters, that is the comfort we have in the Christian life. We may not be much of a match against the evil one, but our God sure is. And He has triumphed and he will triumph and therefore we have the comfort we have the confidence to be able to say that though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us the prince of darkness grim we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word, one little child shall fail him. Indeed, he already has. So let us remember the comfort that is ours as the people of Christ. And let us be encouraged No matter how bad things may seem, no matter how bleak it may look, no matter how overwhelmed and overmatched we might be, let's remember what passages like this remind us of. God always wins. God always overcomes. God always triumphs. And if we are in Christ, then that victory is ours as well. Let's pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks for reminding us of this great comfort that we have in Christ. That we serve a God who reigns, a God who is victorious. And yes, we have an enemy who is great and terrifying, but he is a defeated enemy. And we overcome him through Christ. So Lord, would you fill us with this comfort today? And might it help us to persevere through living in the wilderness and continuing to wage war against the evil one? Lord, would you use your word in the lives of your people today? In Jesus' name we pray.